Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So today we're going to finally look at some PHP code uh, and actually write some code. Uh, prior, before today we did some looking at databases, looking at the structure of Apache, looking at the framework, installing things, and lots of different things, but we haven't looked at too much code. Uh, we did user authentication, showed you the, the password hash functions and stuff like that. But now we're going to uh, look at how you can write your SQL and use that information to handle what we call REST services. And this is where we're going to send and receive data. And so probably after today's lesson, but maybe not until next week, uh, I don't think any of you are close, I hope. Uh, next week I will probably uh, give you guys the access to the public server. And then once you have access to the public server, you can either continue to, to do your work on your laptop and the public server or just use the public server. But I think it's better. I think it's very handy or useful to have a development environment and a production environment. Make sure you do all your testing in the development environment. And then when you think it's ready, push it to production, um, which is the public server. Um, but that really depends on your team because your team can only uh, talk to you through the production server. So uh, that's something for you to discuss. But let's go ahead and get started. We're looking at REST services, sending and receiving data. Oh, one of the applications that I think was on the list for you to install was called Postman. Postman, did y'all install Postman? If you haven't installed Postman, you should go ahead and install it. Postman is what I will use to look at some of the REST services. It's very useful for, uh, for sending data back and forth and to test things. So it's Postman. Okay, get started. So sending data. So when you go to a URL, the web server typically sends you a web page. It can also it can also send just data and not a full web page. So the web server sends a get request. And if you don't remember, because I didn't teach this class, there are four request methods: get, post, put, and delete. In most cases, we are going to look at the get and the post. Um, you can use the put and delete for special cases. Uh, but we probably won't cover those as much. Um, and as it says here, in this project, we'll also be using JSON as a data transport format. So get used to seeing this get and the post. If you recall in my routes file, that's what this was for, app get. Most of them are app get, app get, app get, but then this one was an app post. And so this get request, it's pretty much what it sounds like. You're trying to get a web page. With a post, you're kind of posting or sending data in, instead of getting data. And so if you go to a web page, Probably even this will show you. So I'm using Firefox, and but most browsers have a inspect element. And so I find this very helpful at looking at things. But if I go to the network tab, you can see that it says get. So today we're going to look at get and post methods. We're going to look at statuses. So you can hear, you can see here the status is 200. And so there are different things that you can see when you click on this. You can see request method, get, status, 200, OK. Response, things like that, headers.
the header request header information. Okay. So just telling you that if you have a browser, get used to using the network, and you can also use the inspector tab to look at your HTML and things like that, or your console and debugger too. Um, so as I said, download Postman. The URL is www.getpostman.com. And this is what we'll use to test our REST services. And so I don't have this example right now, but uh, this is what a simple GET request would look like. You have basically a URL. And then, so this is from Postman. Uh, I can show you that example probably. Give me one second. So I'm gonna use this Pokemon controller and I'm gonna grab my routes from here. So I wanna grab these guys. them on my routes file. Let's see if this works. Oops. Yes. Real quick. Bear with me for a second, uh, 15, Pokemon. Case controller, Pokemon simple. Routes, Pokemon simple. Huh. Maybe this is not a good call to member function query on null. Um, maybe this is not a good example. Oh, uh, why not? 15. This DB query SQL. Let's check my database. Pokemon. Oh. I guess we just pretend for a second. We'll just use my slides. Um, sorry about that. So this is a URL. So this is a URL, and this get is getting the data. And in this case, the output, as you can see, says a JSON. And so this JSON string looks like this, which would be similar to the data that comes out of this. So this is. just the MySQL format for the application, but when the code converts it to JSON, it looks like this. So if you don't understand JSON format, um, definitely look it up. 
you basically have a square bracket, a curly bracket between all the elements, and then there's a double quote. Make sure it's a double quote, colon, and double quote. Uh, JSON uses double quotes instead of single quotes. But this is a get request that produces data. Um, after this class, I'll fix this example, but uh, for now we can just look at it and I can show you other examples. So the REST API with the get, um, as I said here, we're cheating by not using the full MVC method, but actually I'm gonna show you the full MVC uh, today. Um, but for our examples before, we were always outputting data to an HTML web page. Instead of sending data to a web page, we can instead only send a JSON string back. And so uh, we're gonna do something like this. Here's the code for something like that. This is something that we're gonna use when Android talks to the web server. So if we have an example, mobile app, somebody goes to a, let's see if I can find one. Well, let's just assume. So somebody goes to the sign up page, right? They fill out the form that says email, password, and they hit send. So the send request goes to the web server and the web server, what does it do? As we all know for this first step, we have to check to see if the email is uh, already existing. And so we write a SQL query and for the Android or the mobile phone, you have to send back some information to tell Android, is it existing or not existing? But you have to remember, this is the Android phone. At the same time, the web team has to build a web page that has a sign up form. And when they hit, when they hit send, it can go to a very similar or same query to see if the user exists. But the web team, they can send the data directly to a web page because they're on the web server. But you can't, the, the web team, they can't send a web page to the Android phone. The only thing that the web team can send to the Android phone is some sort of data string. And so we're going to send back a string of JSON data to the Android phone. And so this is what we do. We have this return response with status. 200 means successful. If there was unsuccessful, you could send different code. 400, usually a 404. Do you know what a 404 error is? Have you seen a 404 error? Page not found, page not found. In this case, you probably won't send back a 404 error because it's not a page not found error. You might send a 400, I mean, there's a, there was some sort of error. Uh, but definitely do not send 200 unless it was successful. Um, and so, with header, content type, application, JSON. So we're telling, we're telling the Android phone to expect data in JSON format. And then we have write, and then JSON encode, and then this pogo is, a, uh, associate, is an associative array, a hash. Well, not hash, but an array hash. So JSON encode is a PHP function. So we have JSON encode that makes a JSON string and we have JSON decode that does the reverse. It converts a JSON string back into an associative array. So just remember JSON encode and JSON decode. They go both ways. And so I'm just gonna show you code. We'll look at code. So 
So if we take an example, So my homepage, 192.168.33.99 is just this uh, sign in form, not sign up, but just, in this case it's just a sign in form because I wanted to, I only care about this email address. Really this example should be the sign up page, but this was easier to look at. So uh, I'm just sending data, doesn't matter, but I hit sign in. I switched. So let's talk about what I'm doing here. So I'm starting with my homepage here and then By view source, if you don't know if you don't know HTML about forms, this is an example. So we have a form tag action equals. This is where I tell the script where do I send all the data. So I want to send data to user slash sign up using a method of post. So as you remember, there are two methods we can send with post and get. Uh, this example, I'm going to use post, but I can switch it real quick and show you what get does. Um, but you see, there's you can do it two ways. There's posting, there's getting. Um, but you're both you're you're sending data. Uh, but most most common when you have a form of data, you're going to send with post. And so this data, for this example here, I only care about this email field. And so this data goes to UCSD sign up or user, no, nope, user sign up. I'm going to user sign up. And because I have method equals post, I have to put a post here. So I've got the same user sign up and then I'm telling it, go to this user controller to the add user function. And so here's my user controller. So I'm going to give you the code in this week two directory before that I saved last night. So I'm not going to give you today's code because that would give you too much. But I'm going to give you, I, I made some changes to the uh, structure to allow us to use models and I added some dependencies and things like that so I, I don't want to I don't want to have to go through all those things uh, but I'm just going to give you that code but that lets us do this so we've got this user controller and I'm going to the add user um, here I just created three variables as part of a user array. So user email, user first name, user last name. So this is how you, in PHP, you, you create a associative array. So I can say, so this is associative array. And I just give it some values. And so this is how I'm calling a function. So I've got this user and I'm calling the get email function and I'm passing in a parameter user email here. And so, so this is in the model. See this get by email. So now we can go to this user model. So now we're, now we're looking at something that's new to us. So we're, this is an example of the model view controller method. And so 
as I mentioned before, if you have a team of people, you might have somebody that's very good at databases. So they might only work on these model files, which are all the SQL queries. The controller person handles all the details of creating the routes and, and doing some stuff in the controller file. And somebody that likes layouts and <clears throat> HTML, they might be the, the view person. So today we're definitely gonna focus a lot on the model person. And so, so I have a file called user model and we're using this get by email function. And so you can see here, I sent in a user email. And so we have email as my parameter that comes in. And so this, so now we're, so now we're looking at real SQL. And so we've got this first line, SQL equals. So this part that says SQL is, you can call it what you want. It could be statement, STMT. It could be SQL, it could be anything you want. So it does not have to be SQL. But to me, if I see SQL, then I know it's a SQL statement. And so here's my SQL. So it says, well, I'm, I'm gonna show you something new. So, but basically select, I only care about the ID field from customers where email equals. So I have this question mark. But before I show you the question mark, uh, if I want to use it the regular way, I'll show you that example. So if you remember my SQL class, you have select ID from customers or email equals single quote, and you can say blah, 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 dot net, right? That's what a SQL query would look like. But because we are looking at this email address, which is a variable, we can change this to, we have to keep the single quote because it's part of the, so you can write it like that. So you have the double quote to here and then the period is what we use in PHP to concatenate, to put two strings together. Uh, in JavaScript, it's a plus. In other languages, it's a plus. Uh, PHP, it's a period. So period, and then the value of the email, and we're gonna add another concatenate, and we wanna grab that single quote. So if you do that, then we have a this DB, and the phrase would be query, okay? and then we execute the query. After we execute the query, we can check and see if there are any results. So results we have to, we can fetch, fetch is an English word for to, to get. If, I, if you tell your dog, go fetch, and you throw this stick, the dog is gonna go fetch or get this stick. So fetch, just it's, Old English word for get. And then we, we have the results, which has the, the results of the fetch, and then we would return the results. So that's the first method. The first method just uses this query. But sometimes I don't like using that method because I have to keep track of all these single quotes. It gets messy. So that's why I have before we had this version. And so we have select ID from customers where email equals question mark. So the question mark is like a placeholder for a variable. And so what we're doing is, I should have taught this as part of the database class, but what we're doing is we're writing a prepare statement. So you see this word prepare? So in English, prepare means to kind of What's a good definition of prepare? To get ready. You know, if I prepare for a test, that means I get ready for the test. 
if I, get, if I prepare for an interview, I get ready for an interview. If I prepare dinner, it means I, I put together, I get dinner ready. So I want to prepare a SQL statement. That means I want to get the server ready to receive a SQL statement. And so, I prepare the SQL statement with this question mark. And then I actually send in the value of that question mark here with this execute. So this execute array email, it's passing the email into that question mark. So the reason we use prepare statements is it can help us to reduce errors in writing SQL statements uh, because by telling the SQL, by telling the server to be prepared, the server knows what your database structure looks like. It knows that your customer's table has some string variables and has some integer variables. And it's smart because, and also helpful because I don't have to put single quotes around my variables anymore. I don't have to remember, was this a, a string? Was this an integer? And so I just have to put a question mark there. I could have a different one. So this one is select from customers where email equals this one. And, you know, F name equals that. And L name equals that. And, you know, is admin equals that. So in this case, this is a string, this is a string, this is a string, but this is an integer. I don't have to write single quotes, single quotes. I don't have to add quotes, 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 and skip a quote because I prepared the server to know. It's almost like I tell the server, hey, I'm going to send a query with these fields. Look at the data type. Be prepared to receive these. Um, variables. So here I could say email, F name, L name is admin. If those were the variables, they would get assigned in order. Email would go here, F name would go here, L name would go here, is admin would go here. And so by doing this, I don't have to add the single quote. So it makes, it makes life easier. It makes it easy to read because you don't have to put the single quote dot this dot that. Um, and the prepare statement also is useful because it's, it makes things uh, faster. If you have repeated queries in my select statement, I'm only right. I'm only running one query. So the speed of the prepare doesn't, doesn't make a very big impact. In this example here, this inserts, it's a different type of prepare statement. I'm only, run, I'm only inserting one record. So maybe here the prepare statement doesn't make a big deal. But when you receive data from the sensor team, the sensor team might send you a CSV file or a JSON string with 50 sets of data. So I could run this add users function 50 times, insert, boom, insert, boom, insert, boom. But like if I just had a very, if I use the original query, there's no, I'm not preparing the server to receive anything. So every time I run a query this way, the server has to look at the SQL string and figure out, is it a string? Is it an integer? And do that every time. So it's doing it 50 times. The server's checking that 
it's checking that SQL statement to see the, the, the data type. But if I use a prepare, I can send the prepare statement one time. And so the server only has to figure out the data type one time. And then it can run the, the 50 inserts without having to look up the data types anymore. So if I had a thousand inserts, I prepare it one time. It, it has to do that work one time. And after that, it just does insert, 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 insert very fast. And so there's a speed benefit of using the prepare statement. Um, and so I definitely would recommend using prepare statements because there's, it's not, it's not hard to write. And so I think you should definitely uh, use it. But there are two types of prepare statements. So you can see here, we have just a regular question mark. Here you might think, okay, maybe that question mark is kind of funny to look at and it doesn't give you enough data or maybe you just don't like it that way. Instead of using a question mark, you could give it a, a bind parameter. So instead of a question mark for here, a question mark here, a question mark here, I give it a name and I put this colon here, colon F name, colon L name, colon email. And so this would be, once again, prepare. So if you use this method, you have to have this bind param. You have to bind a parameter, bind a variable to these guys. So in this version, in the execute statement, we, we kind of did a bind. This execute basically just matched them in order, one by one, one by one. Here with this bind param, you're telling it explicitly, f name, the variable, l name, the variable, email, the variable. And then your execute doesn't have any parameters. And so, it's up to you to decide what's easier to look at, easier to write. They both do the same thing. Uh, and I want to show you one more thing. I, mean, I got a lot of things to show you, but uh, after it executes, there's something that, so after an insert, if you have used the, uh, actually, it doesn't matter. Um, after you do an insert, you know, let's assume like I just now I added this variable. It will tell, and then it will, here's my primary key, eight ID field. This DB last insert ID. So after you insert the variable or the, the variables, whatever, after you do the insert statement, this DB last insert ID will return to you the primary key that was just created. The reason that is useful is because in your project, if you had two tables joined together, you might need to use that primary key to be inserted into some other table as the foreign key. And so, by using this last insert ID, it gives it to you automatically without having to write another query that says, select from customers where email equals whatever, or select from customers where ID, or the, whatever the last ID was. It will give it to you so you don't have to run another query. Um, so that's useful, like I said, in whenever you have to use a foreign key. But let's just take a look at this again. So this is returning results. If it has something, it will return an array of results. And so I just have an if statement. If, if there's an array of results, that means true. So if true, that means that email was a duplicate. So I say, so you return some sort of error message. Email found cannot continue. Else, that meant that this was false. 
that means that nobody was found. It was not an existing email address. So we can do an insert. And so here I just have ID because I know that I wanted to return the last ID. So I'm returning a variable. So I'm gonna grab that variable, ID equals this user, and I call the add user function. But if you notice this add user function, I'm sending it a user. If you can look here, user was an array. So you can send an array or you can send a variable, it's up to you. In this case, I'm sending an array of data into the add user function. So we go back to user model. Here's my add user function. User in this case is an array. SQL equals insert into customers. These are the three fields I want to add into. If you remember, my ID field is a primary key with auto insert, I mean auto increment, so I don't have to do anything. And I have values and I have these bind parameters, F name, L name, email. And I have prepare, SQL. And I have these bind param statements. And these three variables, user first name, user last name, user email, they come from here. And then they execute. And then it gives me back this last ID. And I send that last ID back to here. I say, good, proceed, and I get the number. So if we just run an example, run in. So it says, good, proceed, nine. If I refresh, so it added this new email address, and it gave me back that nine. I run it again. Email found, cannot continue. Because the code is looking at this email address, right? In my database, it sees this email address. So it did this, select ID from customers or email equals. So I can run that query. So it gave back nine. So because it found a value, we know this to be true. So that was an example of just using user models. And uh, so if you want to Google later, there's more than one way to uh, let me get this. So with MySQL queries in PHP, if you Google, you're going to see MySQL I and you're going to see PDO. Do not use this. Only use PDO. Uh, PDO, uh, portable data object. The reason we use PDO is because your queries can be very, uh, some people will say agnostic your code does not have to specify what type of database server you're using. If you were to use MySQL I, some of your SQL statements would say, you know, uh, I haven't used MySQL I in a while.
I can't even tell the answer to that because I don't know it. Um, Settings, dependencies. So as part of the files I'm gonna give you, I changed the dependencies. Uh, okay, so I will tell you this. So we're using PDO just as straight query SQL language. There's more than one way to write a SQL query using regular SQL. And the built the code that I gave you ahead of time that was installed uses something called Doctrine as an entity manager. Um, if you're more advanced, you might like the Doctrine method of writing queries. Uh, I don't teach it that way because I want you to start the very basics of writing plain SQL. Uh, but some people, as they get better at their SQL writing, they want to take shortcuts, and so you can use doctrine to write sh to do shortcuts and things like that um, but for now use PDO I will also say this uh, I've as I've taught this class many times I've I've seen the code of different sort of different student groups it's very interesting because uh, some people are very smart and some people are very uh, I'll say too smart they think they can get away with things. Um, if you have good Google skills, you'll find out that there's a lot of code out there. If you Google really well, I'm sure you could find every query that you need to do this project. Um, but the point, but you won't be learning anything. And so one year, I, after the group made its presentation, I looked at the code, and I said, "Wow, this code is exactly the same code as I saw in the video." There's a video that used PDO and some other stuff. It's like, wow, everything's the same. They didn't even try to hide it. You know, they didn't, you know, usually if I'm going to steal code, I'm going to change some variables, change the order of things, add some comments, make it look different. They didn't even try. But, you know, I didn't notice until after the, the group, after they were done. So it's okay. Uh, maybe this year I will check before he, you get your certificate. <laughs> but yeah, so that group, they were too smart. Another, another person, he was pretty smart, um, and he was using some advanced examples that he had Googled for, and I told him, well, you can do it that way, but if you, go, if you, if you do it that method, which was that doctrine method, I told him, I can't help you because I don't fully understand that method, and it's not what I'm teaching, so it was his decision to use it or not use it, and he, he switched back to the other one, but... Uh, so my point is, this is not rocket science. Every website out there has user login scripts, right? Every website, you've got to sign up users, you have to log out users, you have to reset passwords. I guarantee you could Google forever and find every answer out there. So that's one thing that, that's why this project should not be too hard because there are a lot of answers. Uh, are you familiar with the website Stack Overflow? Or whenever you Google for something, Stack Overflow always has different users with asking questions and they give answers. And I think that's like the programmer's best friend. <laughs> if, you have, if you can write the right Google query, you can find the right answers. <laughs> and so then you can just get my office hours. But I mean, <laughs> uh, Google's your friend. Um, PDO is your friend. And okay, so I said that. So let's take a look example again. Um, so I, as I was going back to that comment about when you send data back to the Android side, you want to send just a JSON string because you're not sending them a web page. It's Android's job to create its own web pages or, or screens or layouts. Um, and so we want to, if we want to send back data in a string, Let's do this. So we'll look at this example of where the email was found. We want to send back some sort of error message.
So I want to do return response with header. And so I want to tell this other side is I'm sending back a JSON string with status of 200 means it was a successful query, but I'm going to change this to 400 just to tell them there's something wrong and then write JSON. And so this JSON, how do you write JSON? Well, you could do it this way. I can create an associative array, JSON, and I can say status equals error, JSON status, oh, JSON message equals uh, email address already exists, right? So here I have my associative array that has two variables, status and message. So actually this would be JSON encode, JSON. So it takes this, so let's take a look here. Based on test.php. All your PHP files start with this question mark PHP. And then I've got my so I can say echo JSON encode. Let's do the, let's just do that so we can see what it looks like. So I can do PHP dash F on test. Ah, oh, there it is. See, so this is a JSON string, right? So if you wanted to, here I could just do this and write the string myself, I could say JSON string equals this. And then add JSON string. Or I can put them in this array, this array method and then do what I did earlier, JSON encode. I like that method just because I can keep these two pieces separate and things like that. So let's use Postman. Uh, can I do this through Postman? Postman user sign up. Oh, be careful what you save. <laughs> This one. Okay. So let's look at this test here. So this form, as I said, 
sends data to user signup. So I can test my user signup. So I've got user signup and I'm posting. Uh, in this case, I'm, I'm hard coding the variables in my, in my form, but I wanna show you how Postman can tell you or show you uh, what type of messages come out. So this part here, like I said, we want to return. So this is an example of Android phone sends data to user sign up. It does the check. Web team says, I want to send them back JSON. And so this line here, content application type JSON. So that's, you can see that Postman tells me I am expecting JSON with status 400. Postman says status code 400. Write the JSON string. And so here it wrote the JSON string. And so Android team needs to be able to receive JSON messages. So whoever's on the Android side they should be able to take this message here and then give an error on the phone. So that first one was if there was uh, already an email address. If the answer was there was no address, we can write a different message. We can say success. And then to me, if there's success, I don't need to send a message, you know, or so it's up to you. If success, you might not need a message, but maybe you can send them back something else. It's up to you. You can send back anything you want. You can say JSON, you know, smell color you know you can send back red it doesn't matter you can send anything so i'll change this to a 200 uh, i'll change this to something else see so i got this status code 200 json string and you can see my json String status success message. Well, I didn't change the message, but not found. And then you can see I sent back color red. You can send back anything you want. And then hopefully we can see that it created number 10. And so this is a very basic example because obviously you guys have to insert a password, hash, nonce, and other things. But I'm just trying to show you um, how we can write the SQL and how to return back um, how to return back uh, JSON statements. But maybe for the website, if there's a website, it can look something like this. You know, all the, all the examples before, we were rendering some sort of HTML or PHTML uh, file that's in the templates folder, and we do return response. So this part is if you want to return JSON, if you want to return the web page, you return this. Does that kind of make sense so far? I hope so. <laughs> uh, Let's go back to the slides real quick. Uh, but this is the guts of the, the REST API. Make sure that you, everything goes to the routes file, returning JSON, things like that. Uh, so this is just kind of showing you how to use Postman Uh, 
blah, blah. Oh, I did teach a repair statement. Oh, so one thing to look at, uh, blah, blah, blah. as you start to write your queries, so you notice that this one has a fetch. There's also fetch all. And so you might wonder, when do I use a fetch versus a fetch all? In this case, I use a fetch because my query is only expecting one value. Select ID from customers or email equals so-and-so. There's only one value to be fetched. And so I use this fetch. If I had something like this, select ID from customers, I'm expecting to receive a lot of values. So I want to, I want to fetch all the records. And so how you handle, so that just, the fetch versus fetch all just changes how the, the results is structured. Um, let's take a look at that. I'm going to change that back to, let's change it to a star. We'll start with fetch and return results. So I'm going to just start here. email equals that. Okay. Uh, let's see. So this first case, I'm only selecting where email equals one person. And so I have that, but if I, if you notice, if I change this to return everybody and I still leave it as fetch and I run it, it still only returns one person, but that's not good because I know the database has 10 people that should have been returned. So if I change that to fetch all and run it, then I get all 10. Uh, so this is a var dump. Sometimes var dump is not the easiest to look at or maybe that way is better. Let's try printr. So if you, so this is a print R, if I view source, page source, it's easy to look at. So this sends back, this fetch all, it sends it back as an array. The array of element zero has, I mean, it's a, it's a big array, but it's got array with element zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight rows on the table. And so, so you can see how it's structured. Uh, it returns all of them. 
So fetch versus fetch all. No, you have to know what your query is expected to return. Um, you can use fetch all. So and leave it as fetch all and run it. And so you notice it puts it as item element zero. It's, up, it's kind of up to you. How do you want to do it? Because fetch all always gives an indexed array. Item zero, something. Item one, something. Item two, something. If you just use fetch, it doesn't have to show the zero because there's only one array. So, so this is kind of this is where it helps if you know computer science-y stuff. You know, do you want something like this? And then and then the array data. Or do you just want item? like that. If you, use, if you use fetch all all the time, you're always going to have a zero, one, two, three, four, five. If you only have just a fetch, then you don't have to worry about the zero and you can deal with this. So that's a, that's a preference for you. I use fetch and fetch all. Um, I'm going kind of fast. Today, I have an hour and a half, and actually, I probably will use all of the time. <laughs> Sometimes other lessons I don't use all the time. Um, so this is more example about the prepare statements, how to bind the parameters. Postman with parameters. Postman with two parameters. Sending back data. So here we send back JSON, as I showed. Let's think about this. Um, so the web server needs to receive data. And so it can receive data. In the body. So you see this body here. That's this body here. And so we can say, So let me send it someplace else. User sign up, user. So go back to our routes. We had the user sign up. Let's do a different one. User sign up test. Test. Add user test. Test. So let's try this user controller, add user test. Let's just make sure it works. Echo the world. 
So we're going to add user sign up test post. He's not found. User sign up test routes. User sign up test. Page not found. Why is that not found? User sign up test routes. Oh, save it. Must save file. Send. Internal server error. Thirty-five. User controller. Help. Okay. So I got my hello world. So, so now I know that it's going to my add user test. Uh, let's see, I suppose. No. Uh, request get parse body. Uh, Body raw sign up test status says hello world no Uh, what am I doing? Receive JSON, parse body, request, parse body. Receive JSON. Hmm, my examples keep changing, so sometimes these don't work. Parsed body request get parsed body. No. Body. None. Form data. Key. Name. Jeffrey. Send. Well. Raw text. Oh, that's why. There we go. Ta -da. Okay. Sorry for that delay. Um, so, if for some reason you want to send JSON to the web server, you can send, or you can send any data you want to the web server. Um, the, the web server can receive JSON, it can receive form data. Um, so web team, you need to be able to receive those different things. Um, the reason I say you need to be able to receive JSON data is because when you, you might get sensor data back as a JSON string. Sometimes if there's just, uh, I think when they send real time data, it's gonna be JSON string. Um, sometimes they might send uh, historical data. Historical data might be all the sensor data for a, an, a minute, an hour, a day. In that case, it's going to be a CSV file because it's too big. Your JSON string is going to be too big, and so you'll send CSV. But if they're going to send you uh, JSON data, your code will look something like this parse body equals request parse body so this is saying android 
needs to send the JSON string in the, in the body. And I think maybe John can tell you how to do that. Um, but this is an example of a JSON string that gets sent to this form. And so the web team would use a, this is your code, request parse body takes that data. And so you have parse body. So parse body has the array. So you can say, echo the message received was parsed body and then I say message. If I don't want to dump. See, the message received was and so I parsed, so this is what I received from Android side, because, because I have Postman, I can test, I can simulate. So I'm simulating what Android might send to me. So, and I can get the answer back. The message received was, and here I echo out whatever the message was. You know, a real example might be uh, date time, 2019, my zero button doesn't work very well, <laughs> dash zero seven, seven, 16, you know, 11, 44, 52, and they might be CO2, 33, PM 25. NO2. Temp. seven, right? So if that's what I sent back, you know, I could say the temperature. Yeah. Received was temp. So you see the temperature received was 67, right? But you could also have, like I said, they can send you back more than one set of data. So your JSON string could have you know, the data from, this was at 52, we do it every second or five seconds, so this might be at 57. CO2 went up to 39, PM 2.5 went down to 255, NO2 went down, temperature went up to 77. So I don't know if this is gonna work because your parse body has more than one uh, piece of data. So if we go back to this parse body and send it, now you've got two sets of data, so you have to loop through it. So I can say, so here's a PHP for each parsed body as data. So let's see what this does. Nothing. Nothing. See? Uh, we'll, we'll add a. So 
so what's so here's my teaching PHP. So we've got a so now because parse body has more than one piece of data, you can see my JSON string has two elements in it. If I wanted, so this is where you might have um, your insert code. For each parse body as data, I could Let's imagine this was uh, you might have some like add sensor data, right? So for each set of data, you want to insert the sensor data. So you want to loop through the data, insert, 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 insert. So you can do that. Um, But the point is, you can loop through the data using a for each. You can loop through data just named this data. So I do as data. Data is just the name of the current set of data that's being looped through. So first time you pass through the loop, this is your data. Second time you pass through the loop, this is your data. Uh, so we have for each as data. Uh, so you can see that. Um, but here you would probably just want, instead of putting the for each here, you can just send this call, add sensor data, and then you could send the whole parse body like that. And then you would send the parse body to add sensor data you would come here and this is where you can do the loop and use a prepare statement because you want to prepare the statement one time and then loop 50 times by doing it this way it's running it's you're not taking advantage of the prepare statement because it's it's going to prepare 50 times so it's better to send the data to the model and have the model loop through the data uh, so, okay, that's that. I'll send you the example for this one later. Uh, so, as I mentioned, the web team needs to be able to receive data from JSON in JSON format from the server side, I mean, from the Android side in JSON. But it also needs to be able to receive data in CSV format. And so you can use Postman to test that too. Uh, so I don't have the code for it, but uh, form data file. So you see this file? So if you want to run a test through Postman, you could simulate Android sending you a CSV file. So you go to form data and then you can click on, well, let's, let's use this one. So you can see, you see that file, text and file, go to file. And here you can actually select whatever CSV file is. So like this feeds to import and then you could, let's just see what comes through. Just for the fun of it, let's, let's do this. Uh, print our data. I don't even know what this code is gonna do. Send. Nothing. Feeds to import CSV name so this is not in the parsed body this is uh,
Hmm. Okay, I don't have the code for my CSV saving. Here's the code. Uh, well, so saving CSV data from Android. Uh, so whenever uh, this files. Aha, uh -huh. there we go. So this is, you're probably not gonna need this until another two weeks, but so, when they send a CSV file, the way PHP handles that file is, it gets saved into a, a temporary area on the, on the web server, and it's given a temporary name. So Postman, you can see it has a temporary name, temp slash phpq, blah, 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 blah. And you can see also the name of the original file. Uh, the file format is text CSV. And so I have this function here where I give it a new name. So string replace means I wanna replace whenever I saw the CSV with a dash time. So I'm basically, I'm putting a timestamp on the name of the file. And then PHP has a move uploaded file. So every file that comes and gets uploaded to the server has a name dollar sign underscore files. And if the, if the file was under a certain variable, you would see that file, just like on Postman. I've got name, so mine has name here. If I change this to be file, and I did it, you would see it changed to file. So it's just part of the array. So you can see we've got files and then file. Temp name is this part, this temp name is the temporary name of the file on the server. And so what I'm doing is I'm moving this temporary file to a new location. And then, and that's it. So now, so now I've got this CSV file that I've uploaded, that's been uploaded and saved to a new location. And so now, um, it's up to it's up to your web team to process that function, that that CSV file. And so, uh, you can open the file, load the data, and save it to the database, or you can just read the contents of the file and not use the database. Because it's, it's historical data, so I don't know if you want to save in the database or just leave it in a CSV file. Uh, that's up to you. But, um, so this is the code for saving the uploaded file. Um, yeah, I got three minutes left. Good. Um, I went through too many things today very fast. So uh, even if you watch the video, you might be a little confused. So don't be afraid to ask me questions. Um, but the, the main point of this was to show you how to return data back to the web side and the Android side um, based on based on writing SQL queries. So now you should have uh, a platform to try to write SQL queries and to test your SQL skills. Um, and as I said, I'll give you my week two folder that has everything before I started today's lesson that should get you started with uh, the right format. And, but pay attention. Um, this is where you can also test your Apache configuration skills because uh, 
when I give you the week two directory, you can, you know, you have, you can put a week two folder on your server and you have to configure Apache to point to this week two server. And so if you notice my week two folder is inside the var www HTML, it's not inside that IOT directory. See, before I put everything in this IoT directory, but now this week too, I put it at the same level as IoT. And so you just have to be able to configure your Apache to point to a different place. So that's, that's something that you can uh, practice. I can't show you everything. <laughs> so you can try to do that. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Yeah, half a minute left, less than a minute. Mm -hmm.